Hello, my friends. For those of you that have been sending me such kind and healing words, it's been about a week now since my surgery and I'm feeling good. Still no pain meds and pain is minimal. Boy, I am going to hit a uh, kind of a tough one today. And this is via request. I'm not sure if your name is pronounced Thomas or you're from uh, a European background. I know sometimes in some areas it's Tomas. So I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, but I'm going to say Thomas in the United Statesian way. And Thomas wrote and asked about, he said he's on his rewilding journey. And he asked about meat eating because often rewilding incorporates hunting. We go out into the woods to connect with nature and do that in that very primal way of hunting for our food and being very directly related to it. And then he encountered a, a deer and I think her two fawns and felt this deep compassion and connection with them and started to wonder if that was the right path or he's been thinking about veganism. There's also a friend of mine here, you know who you are, actually a couple of you, that have spoken to me about being vegetarian or vegan. And I have to say that I've appreciated their methods of approach. In the past, when I have expressed that I do eat meat, and I will be clear and say that currently I do eat meat in my life, that they have uh, come at me pretty strongly with what might be interpreted as, as verbally violent um, reactions to learning that I do consume meat. And that always seemed odd to me because to me, veganism seems to be a, a pathway reaching towards greater peace. And you know, unfortunately, we often see this. We humans love to have people believe and live the same way we do. And of course, we always tend to believe that what we do is right and that others are misguided. Often we do this so strongly that we will not look at other evidence to the contrary and just get ego bound to our way of living. That doesn't allow us to grow or change anymore. And when we have a certain way and we approach someone and put them down for their way, usually that just sets up an ego defense and strengthens them in their own position. So I don't think it's a really effective way to try to convert someone over to your methodology much better is to come at people with compassion and love and to present evidence and do so in a way that is as, I don't want to say non-emotional because it's, it's one thing to express emotions of caring. But again, if we attach our emotions of condemnation onto that, then we're going to throw up the ego defenses of whoever we're talking with and we're not really going to get anywhere in that conversation. Today, what I'd like to do is to share some of my journeys, my explorations with this concept of what's the best way to live, vegan, vegetarian, omnivore, and I hope that it can foster some good discussion down in the comments as these videos usually are blessed with. Boy, jump in here and say, ah, thank you to all of you who are subscribers and who comment down there because you make this channel what it is. It could not be this without you. So I said that very recently in a video and I say it again because it's so true and I really mean it. I think when we look at this issue, we can first of all level the playing field and all come together 
by realizing that we all have one commonality. And that is, sorry if this sounds radical, that we all are constantly doing harm. And I'll further that and say that all of us are constantly killing in order to live. This was a big realization for me because I literally, when I was a kid, I told my parents I didn't want to mow the lawn, not because I felt lazy, but because I said I could hear the grass screaming. And I had concern that the plants could feel. Later on, I came to the point where I killed my first animal. I was at the a wilderness school that I trained in, and I was very, very hungry because they did not feed us well there. And there was a an animal, a groundhog, that was hit by a car. And it, I thought it was dead, but it was not dead. It was actually just its neck broken and nearly dead. But I had an experience there where I tried to put the animal out of its misery by killing it. And I saw that even as damaged as it was, how much life force was in that animal. I was crying before I stuck the knife down through its chest and was crying more and more as it wouldn't die as easily as I had seen in the movies. In the movies, we see somebody who's shot with an arrow or shot with a bullet and they fall over dead. Well, anybody that works in the medical field or in the military, you know that it's not usually that clean. And it certainly was not that clean when I had to kill my first mammal. As time went on, I was wrestling with this deep compassion that I felt for all the beings around me, and this realization that every time I ate, I was sitting down to eat my plant and animal friends. This blossomed into the realization that if I drive a car I am going on a slaughter rampage. The amount of, look on the front grill of any vehicle, motorcycle, moped, whatever it is, and you're going to see the slaughter on the front of that vehicle. If I walk in the woods, even barefoot, much gentler, but I'm squashing and killing things, even if I like seal myself up in, in a room and never go outside and decide I'm never going to eat anything again, I'm still, my body inside, my immune system, is on a killing rampage. There's all kinds of viruses and bacteria and, and germs and stuff that are going in there, interacting with my body. My immune system is constantly engaged in killing them. So I had to come to terms with wanting to be peaceful and live as gently as I could and realizing that I am constantly killing. This is true for all of us. No matter how peacefully we live, we are killing all the time. And when we realize that, then instead of seeing, oh, that person's killing a cow, but I'm only killing these certain plants, I'm a better person, and condemning them, we can come together and say, wow, here we are. And I think this following statement would be true, <laughs> be true for all of us. That is that all of us would like to live with harming as few other beings as possible, doing as little damage to the world as we can. That being said, we come together saying, we hold that sentiment, and yet we're all killers. Now, if we can agree on that and come together, then we can start to look and see, well, what's going on when we kill? And I mean mentally, emotionally. Because we'll find that what guides most people, probably almost all of us, 99 percent when we are eating food is how much we can relate to the thing that we're killing. So it's much more difficult to kill something if we relate to it. 
in the grocery mart, this comes forth because it's a lot easier for me to buy a plastic covered package of ground beef than it is to go out to the barnyard and hold the gun to the head of the cow and shoot it and cut it open and bring out the meat. Very, very different. The cow has eyes, it's made of flesh, it's making sounds, it has its babies over there. I start to relate to it and see it as a fellow living being. That package from the grocery store, eh, not so much. And that's why it's easy for a lot of us to, for instance, eat meat. And yet, if we had to kill that animal ourselves, then whew, becomes a totally different game. Now, this, I think, is across the board. So combat vets that I've spoken to have said that it's much easier, as much as they might not agree with this in their heart of hearts, it's easier to pull the trigger when a person seems very different than they are. If I look out and I see a person and I say, wow, is that person a father like me? And you know, do they have a wife who they love? And maybe they look more like me, much harder to pull the trigger than when I can look at that person and say, they're not me. I do something in my mind to create a wall, a barrier between myself and that other living being and to think of it as less than I am. This is what makes it easy for people, again, like myself who eat meat, to say, well, an animal is just an animal. It doesn't think, it doesn't really have feelings in the same way as a human does. I put a wall between myself and that animal. Now, I'm going to say that for vegetarians and vegans, too. That the barrier that I put between myself and plant creature, that's an easier barrier in some ways to erect, because plants don't look like me. It's easier for me to justify it by saying, well, plant doesn't really feel, it doesn't really have emotions or a mind that is anything like what I could relate to as a human being. So then it's okay for me to kill plants. The problem here is that science even has been learning more and more that animals are much more, quote, intelligent than we think, than we've thought in the past. It's gone from thinking of them as instinct-based machines to creatures that have an emotional life that we can see the chemicals that, that are showing they're having different emotions about things. And that we look at them and we see, wow, they register pain and they can feel pain. And that line, that barrier we draw between ourselves and many of the animals is starting to crumble down if we look at new evidence. And if we start to look at new evidence coming out with plants, we're seeing that the plant world and the forest is a perfect example, is much more a living being than we thought. There's some amazing research being done on forests, finding that this is not just a bunch of individual trees that are basically dead objects, that all these trees are interrelated with each other in a community, that they're actively communicating with each other through scent, maybe even through sound, through the ground, through their roots, that they have electrical impulses, they travel much slower than ours, Again, difficult for us to relate to, but they have electrical impulses that seem to be somewhat similar, at least, to a nervous system. It could be that we are starting to uncover that these trees, these plants, are living, feeling beings. Like the mind of a dolphin, or a cow, or a chickadee, is very different than my own, but maybe not better or worse. So the mind of a tree or a forest may be very much 
equal in quality. And I mean equal in value. Just different in its, the way it expresses itself. And so I sit here comfortably in my human body and mind and I look out around me and I judge and say, what is more and less? What is deserving of me killing? But often I'm not making an actual judgment that's based on emerging evidence. I'm making a judgment based on my emotional attachment to the things around me. Because it is a heck of a lot easier for me to pull the trigger on a carrot than it is on a deer. It's a lot easier for me to pluck, oh, let's say one of these Canada Mayflower leaves or plants up than for me to take an ax to one of these red pines. It's the emotional value that I put on that other living being. And then because I happen to be the biggest, toughest creature around, in general, I get to make the decision of who lives and who dies. This puts a lot of weight on us because we as humans become responsible for this killing that we're doing. And for me, at least, it was sobering to realize that I might be making those decisions not really based on what value beings actually have, but rather just on my emotional attachment to them. It exposed me for being a judging, judgmental being that was killing based on my judgment. Thomas, when you think about hunting, you're, there's a lot to that. You're going out into the forest and taking the life of one of these creatures that a white-tailed deer, probably the most common thing that we would hunt, is very easy to relate to. They have huge, beautiful, brown, liquid eyes. They look innocent. It's exceedingly difficult for me. I've killed a couple deer in my life, and it is exceedingly difficult. It is a falling my head off type of thing, not an ah, excitement, I've killed something. It's, wow, I've killed something that I can really relate to. And up here, I mean, I know most of the deer by name in these woods, and they just ha have their children. And so now we're getting to know their children. And they are friends. And come hunting season, it's likely some of them won't be coming back to our yard. Now, why I said this is, is complicated is that if we start thinking about all the living beings and how we as humans are interacting with them, it's not just about what we eat. It is about things like if we drive a car and how much. It is about things like what we buy. Are we consuming plastic? When we buy a bunch of lumber, that's dead trees. Here's a staff. This is a wonderful gift that, Simon, thank you, <laughs> that somebody gave me. That is, is a precious gift to me. And it is also a dead tree. I might walk around with this and enjoy it, but it's a dead tree. And if I were to go out and take one of these ironwood trees and chop it down, it'd be hard for me. Because these trees, they make up the forest. When you go out into the forest to hunt, here's one thought. You're going out, you are becoming an integral part of this environment. I think that one of the biggest issues right now is that we have set up a, a false idea, essentially, that here's humans and here's nature, and we're two separate things. And when we're two separate things, then we've put a barrier between us, and we can treat nature like a separate thing. When you go out and hunt, and Thomas, you're probably going to be like me. If you kill a deer, you're probably going to be crying. You are tearing down that barrier. And you're plunging into that. You're becoming in a direct interaction with that environment. 
and you're becoming more intimate with it and understanding it at a deeper level, an emotional level. And you have to open yourself up to the emotions you're going to feel. And you're going to be taking responsibility for the killing that you're doing. Very few of us do that. We might live as peacefully as we can. I might be you know, strict vegetarian, but I drive my car. And I never stop to get around to the front and say, dang, I'm sorry, 564 bugs, butterflies, yeah, all these creatures that I've killed. And to take responsibility for that. Would I grab a butterfly and pick its wings off? No. But for a pleasant ride to the park, I would drive and kill 10, 20, 30 butterflies. So when you go out and you hunt, you are doing something, in my view, positive in the sense that you are getting into a direct relationship with that experience of killing. You're stripping off the illusions. You're saying, look, I kill. And if I'm going to kill and I'm going to eat meat, I'm going to kill it and eat the meat. Another way to look at it is that our forests, for instance, up here, they are managed to maximize deer right now. The amount of deer, I love them, they're my friends, and they are very swiftly changing the woodlands as we know it. Yes, we can see humans are part of nature. The actions that they're doing right now with deer and keeping them heavily overpopulated means that these woodlands are not getting to have, if you look back behind me, you're going to see that there are not the sapling, the little teeny trees. Most of these little trees are taken out by the deer long before they ever have a chance. There's some interesting, you can look it up online, there's some interesting experiments that have been done with fencing off an area of woodland and watching the amount of biodiversity that returns in those fenced off areas as opposed to where the deer are actively grazing. Deer used to be balanced out with a high wolf population. And so if you look back in trapper days and such and you read the accounts, it seems pretty clear that deer were not very easy to come by. Now I drive down the road here by Rewald University and on a good day you will count hundreds of deer during a mile long drive. It's a different world we're creating. So in a way you're doing your small part. You might be killing a deer, but you're giving life to other beings through that killing. And this is where getting, breaking down that barrier between you and nature, getting ourselves intimate with it, starts to see that we are not just killing machines. Killing also is a cycle, a balance with the rest of the world. So when a deer is killed, it's going to eat less. And that might mean that this tree back here lives. So it's not as simple as our linear minds would make it out to be. The world is not linear. The world is organic, it's circular, it's messy. Everything is interwoven and interconnected. And that is why hunting may not be quite as evil as we think. On the other hand, you might decide that you don't want to. And that is perfectly okay. There, I can look around and I can say, look, I relate to some beings more than others. So it's just easier for me to, let's say, eat a fish than it is for me to eat beef. Because I relate a lot more to that cow than I do to the fish. And that's where I am, personally, me mentally, emotionally, where it actually is easier. And I have to say, that's where I am in my journey. That doesn't mean I can't change or evolve. It doesn't mean things will be different next week, maybe. But right now, that's where I am. Sometimes I've thought I want to be a vegetarian. And then I start thinking about the crops 
the way that agriculture works today. And the way it works is that something like this, a forest or a natural prairie, is mowed down. If I am eating soybeans, if I am eating carrots from the grocery, any kind of conventional plant, and I would say, even if it has organic on it, usually it's been done in the same way, then I am party, I am responsible to the slaughter of this entire forest or this entire prairie. And the amount of living beings that have died in order to give me that food is staggering. Microorganisms, squirrels, rabbits, deer, as you probably know, degradation of the environment is the number one thing that is driving a lot of species to extinction. And that shows us that a lot of animals are dying in order for me to eat plants. So again, it's a web. I can't just eat carrots and potatoes and think that I am not killing animals. I'm not doing it directly, but I sure as heck am doing it indirectly. And in huge, huge ways. As we learn more about the forests, we find that it takes generations of trees until a forest becomes the being that is a forest. And it's a deep network of interrelationships between fungi and plants and animals and birds. It creates its own weather system, its own climate, climate inside of it, microclimate. And when a forest is cut down to make fields. I've destroyed that, not just right now, but it will, even if I left it now, it would take 500 years or more for that to come back. So that's the killing that I have to be responsible for, even if I decide to be vegetarian or vegan. Because I'm not, I can't wash my hands of the blood. How do I wash my hands of the blood? How do we eat and live doing the least amount of harm possible? That's a really good question, and I think it's up for debate and exploration. I think to answer that question, we have to look at different ways that might be possible of procuring our food. I can go out and wild gather and I can take one leaf from a lot of plants, and yes, I'm doing a lot less damage than I might do going to the grocery store. But still, I have to own up to it. Barefoot even, I'm crushing creatures, I'm compacting the soil, I'm destroying a lot of things. But here it is, remember, the death is also life. A tree, if it falls and dies, it's not just dead. In a way, it becomes more alive than it was before. All kinds of creatures now make that home. It becomes humus. It is nourishment for the rest of the forest. Again, these are not clear-cut things so much as an interwoven spectrum. Now, I'll share with you what our family does. Because... We, I think like all of us, are trying to live as with as least amount of harm as possible. So, we do eat meat. We try to get our meat from farmers who we know, where we have gone and we've seen their farming practices. We see how they treat the animals. We get some meat from roadkill. These are animals that have died on the road and are usually just left there. They're not left to be wasted. The vultures, the crows, the ravens, the eagles, all kinds of decomposers are going to use that and enjoy it. It's an important part. So we're still taking from nature, if we want to separate ourselves out from nature, even when we take roadkill. But roadkill, in our view right now, our emotional attachment, it's an animal that has died anyway, and if we can take that meat, and use it for our family. Awesome. When we eat plants, we 
try to, at the least, buy organic. And again, the organic standards are not what we think they are. And it does not mean that these plants have been grown in an environmentally healthy way. But it's maybe a step better than conventional. But we try to get most of our plants, again, either from the wild or from farmers who we know and we can see their practices. There are farmers out there who try to farm in a way that allows other plants to grow, that has prairie plants and other things for pollinators to come in, that lets some weeds come up and harvest the wild weeds. So there are, there are better ways than just stripping down some land, cutting it flat and only growing a singular crop or even rotating crops. Better yet, can we grow our own food? That's hard for us to do way up here in the north, but we do a little bit of it. And growing your own gardens, now you are right there with it. You get to be directly related to these plants and to see, are you going to be using pesticides and herbicides and degrading the soil, or are you going to do things in a way that allows the soil to grow healthier, that maybe invite selectively a couple critters in to also enjoy your garden that has flowers for pollinators and then and maybe this sounds strange to some ears but i think that it's vital that when we eat food whatever it is we own up to the killing we've done if i sit down to eat some usda organic carrots and potatoes i don't just say thank you carrots and potatoes i say thank you prairie and all you once were the prairie dogs the ferrets the snakes the mice the burrowing owl all these creatures that called this place home all of them were displaced killed lost their home at the very least to give me these potatoes and carrots to own up to the killing we're doing and then to enjoy the food, to really say, you know what? I realize a sacrifice has been made and I'm gonna enjoy this food to the fullest. And here's the important part. When I take these calories, this energy into my body, what am I going to use it for? Because I can't even lift an arm without intaking that energy from other beings. And how am I going to honor those other beings? Am I going to lift my arm to hit out at someone else? Am I going to lift my arm to give in kindness? When I speak, I cannot speak without the energy from those other beings. Are my words going to reach out and harm? Or are they going to reach out and inspire or uplift or lend an emotional helping hand? What will I do with all the resources that I am given? With the money I am in possession of? With my mental, physical gifts? With the land I'm a steward of? With the community that I'm a part of? All of this is possible because these other beings fuel me and allow me to take this next breath. So how can I honor them? with my actions and that I think is the most essential part when we choose what to eat if we're gonna drive or not if we're gonna walk on the forest <laughs> floor whatever my choices are to acknowledge what I'm doing and then to say thank you to use that energy and that my friends I think that is it. It's not so much about what we eat, though that is important. But it's what we do with that energy and then what we put back out into the world. My final thought on this is that in the end of this experience of us killing, giving life, and 
being part of that cycle. We get to die. And then we have this body that can be taken and eaten by others. The energy from your body, when it is eaten by others, what do you hope that energy transmutes into? In some places, they're still doing burials where they pump our bodies filled with chemicals to try to preserve that body for as long as possible. I'd urge you to look into natural burials and other methods that take your body and put it back into the environment. Think about that as a way of giving your substance back in a way that it can integrate and become part of this world again. My friends, thank you for watching. I know that was a long one, but hopefully you found some gems in there and it spurred some thoughts and ideas. Share your thoughts and ideas down in the comments. And speaking of deer, maybe she was behind me and I didn't notice her, but over here is who we call Bandit. Can you see her back there? That is Bandit. So share in the comments and can't wait to talk with you down there. Love you all. Thanks for being part of our channel. We'll talk with you soon.